This episode of Where Did the Road Go is brought to you in part by our Patreons. In particular, this month is being sponsored by Lindsay Marie Trebet and Nick Martin. I thank you both so very much. And if you want to become a patron, you can do so at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And now our show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. All right, welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? Tonight, I am here with, uh, I'm going to try and say it properly, Riker and and Stark. Did I get it close? Yeah, close, yeah. Quite close, close enough. <laughs> okay, all right. Good to be here. Hi. And, and what, what, what are your full names? My name is Bernhard Reicher. Uh, and I'm Rudolf Stark. Okay, and you are based out of Austria. Mm-hmm. In Graz, Austria, which is the second biggest city in, in Austria, yeah. Okay, now you, you do a YouTube show and sometimes podcast as well. Yeah, it's called Reicher and Stark, um, based on our surnames. And uh, we've been uh, going since two years now, and it's all about magic, mysteries, the paranormal, consciousness phenomena. Mostly we, we talk um, with each other in front of the camera or uh, sometimes audio only. And sometimes we invite people to, you know, talk about stuff like a roundtable conversation. Right. And uh, for the most part, it's an Austrian or a German. I'm sorry. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But we do occasional shows in English, uh, which are then usually um, podcast shows. So we had Joshua Kutchin on, we had uh, Susan Demetri Sinclair on, uh, Jeff Kripal, for example. But yeah, it's just every other month when we, when we find an interesting guest that fits into the show. Well, it's we a good love- list already. Yeah, yeah, we would love to do more shows in English, but unfortunately, the German-speaking audience uh, is not used to it, and we got very uh, few um, clicks or, or views on on these shows. Hmm. It's a pity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I would I would think more people over there speak English than people here speak German. Yeah, obviously, but it's it's still an an issue of uh, language barrier. It's not as easy to listen to English shows, obviously, and um, so people can can have a basic conversation in English language. English language, and um, the schooling system is quite good, and the education regarding uh, different languages. But when you try to listen to uh, complex um, concepts and stories, mm. and, and you have an accent of different states and areas in English language and the difference between British and American English and stuff. So it's not as easy to listen to for a lot of people and to, yeah. Fair enough. But we, we somehow try to bridge that gap and bring over the information from the English uh, speaking sphere from regarding magic, regarding uh, what's going on there, regarding um, high strangeness phenomena, the re- research, and then try to somehow translate it and bring it to the German-speaking countries and vice versa. Maybe some ideas we have here that never bridge the gap to the Anglo-Saxon sphere. So, yeah, that's what we basically try to do with the show. Nice. Nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I I think I want to get to some of those ideas later, maybe. Um, So what about you guys personally? How did you how did you each get into this, uh, get interested in this type of stuff? Yeah, I had the the fortune. The 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 I was lucky to grow up in a family uh, that was into this stuff. So it's I think you could call it a magical family tradition. As far as I know, I'm the the fourth generation um, who is into this. Uh, maybe it goes on longer, but uh, I can I can prove it for four generations now. Um, so. My grandfather, who was one of my most important mentors, he uh, showed me herbs when we walked in the woods and showed me where the, you know, the, the dwarves live or the gnomes. And mm. he, yeah, he had, he had three near-death experiences and he told uh, them to me when I was very little. 
and I learned uh, to, you know, to hypnotize when I was 14 and I had lots of out of body experiences when I was a child and, and I grew up in this sort of uh, subculture. Um, so I uh, get to, to know, I got to know uh, spiritual teachers and healers and indigenous shamans from a very young age. and. Uh, this was basically I was I was steeped into this stuff and um, yeah I, <laughs> I I I don't know otherwise. Yeah, yeah, no, that's really cool. I'm I'm very thankful for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it was a bit different. I I as as a child, I had some strange experiences. Some you know. Um, uh, hag attacks uh, and some strange out of body experiences and some experiences of precognition but i never had a concept of it like i never could put it into any framework so i, I never really thought about it it was just weird and so i i think if i if i if anyone would have ever told me back in the days that that's something strange or that it there's a name for it that it might be uh, associated with um, high strangeness or the paranormal or whatever. I would have freaked out, but because I <laughs> didn't have an, any concept of it. I mean, obviously, I heard I saw movies and stuff, but I never made that connection with the things that happened to me. It was always just strange, so I never, never made anything out of it. And then I then puberty came and teenage years, and I joined the in Austria. We have a, a mandatory military or or a social service, so I joined the military, and then that was the time when I completely shut that off. And in the mid two thousands, I had a quite horrible out of body experience that woke me up, basically, so to say, like it slapped me in the face with a baseball bat and I couldn't ignore that part of my life anymore. And then, yeah, from then it went on learning um, some symbolistic hypnosis and uh, remote viewing, like the technical military grade remote viewing. And um, yeah, and then I did a lot of experiments with the Hemisync uh, program with the binaural beat stuff from Robert Monroe mm -hmm. and had some, and whatever I did, like I had some spectacular remote viewing hits in the beginning and had some quite interesting out of body experiences but nothing nothing really worked out like and it was never my my thing so to say like there was always something missing and but it was enough to to realize that there is a reality to it because in in my mid 20s i was a very materialistically oriented person i studied finance and i worked on later as an equities and derivatives trader for an austrian investment bank and stuff so i was focused on science and natural sciences and, and numbers and and stuff so even even psychology was mumbo jumbo for for stupid people back in the days for me. So it was, I was a bit harsh there, but I didn't know better, so to say. And then then that that out of body experience came and it slapped me in my face for two hours and it was horrible. It was not a love and light experience, but it was enough to yeah. Can can, can you talk a little more about that? Uh yeah sure. Um, I was um living with my girlfriend with my. Yeah, former with, with my girlfriend back then, and I woke up somewhere in the night, and I had like this sleep paralysis, paralysis, and I, it was strange, and some suddenly there was a figure hovering above my bed, um, like more a figure of light. I I think it was female. I'm not not exactly sure. So and then it it started to talk to me, and it was the most normal thing ever. I don't know why. It I was like in a different state of consciousness in a bit in a way so it was for that part of me it was the most normal thing ever that yeah that's totally no normal we know each other and we talk to each other and i can't really remember what we talked it must have been like from the amount of information i got i think it was like 15 minutes or so mm -hmm. but i can't remember i have some kind of an amnesia about what we actually talked and the next thing i remember that yeah whatever that figure um Okay, if you if you agree to what we talked about now, then nod with your head three times. And that was the moment my, my logical mind started to kick in and started to panic because I was not aware of what we just talked about. I had no <laughs> idea. So then um, and I suddenly felt my body nodding, nodding three times. 
and I was yelling at myself and I was panicking and, and, and I was screaming at myself, how stupid am I that I do that now? But my, auto, my body did that automatically and then I was pulled out of my body and I was in the middle of the room and I was seeing my girlfriend and myself, the, the bodies lying there and then I'd, it was black and white and it started, everything started to spin around me and, and, and shadow figures moving around and, and I was just panicking and I wasn't sure if I'm dying or going crazy and as the event went on, I wasn't sure which one I would prefer. Hmm. So sometimes I wanted to die and sometimes I wanted to go crazy. So I wasn't sure about that. And it lasted for roughly two hours. I tried to jump out of the window and I managed to do that in that state. And, but suddenly the whole, the, the, the glass door flipped back and threw me into the room again. And then the, I tried to enter my body again. I managed to do that and then I got pulled out again. And yeah, then two hours later, I woke up because my girlfriend left to work quite early. And then, yeah, I was in shock for basically two days. I cried. I didn't feel any emotion at all. It was just tears streaming down my face for two days. And, oh, oh sorry. Um, uh, uh, <clears throat> yeah. And, and it still affects you, obviously. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> and, and yeah, it wasn't that. And that, but. My, I was in a very toxic relationship back then. My girlfriend didn't even notice. And then in the evening, she came home from work and we, she, she had din, uh, dinner and she just out of the ordinary, just completely out of the ordinary, she, she started to suddenly talk to me like she was in a kind of trance state or something. I'm not sure. She suddenly looked at me and told me the story that, oh, last night I had this very strange dream, like something tried to pull you into the afterlife or into the other world or whatever and but you somehow managed to come back and then like she, she snapped back from the from whatever she was in and like she never told me that it was really she just went on and eating her dinner and we never talked about that and, and that again so it was just strange and then from that on it, it took me a few days to to deal with that shock and to realize, uh, yeah, I have no idea what it was. I started to do some research online, and then I, then I came across the work of Robert Monroe and the out-of-body stuff. And then, then I got fasc fascinated by that. And then everything went on from that, and yeah. It, it, it certainly sounds like something was trying to change the path of your life. Uh, yeah, I tried to, to rem I tried to figure it out, and I somehow started to remember bits and pieces of what happened there. And it was like, you're either going to die now or you really have to deal with your, well, yeah, you really have to deal with uh, your life issues now because I, somehow everything went wrong in my life, so to say. And it was like magic trying to get back to me. And like you, you've, you've suppressed that stuff for over 10 years now and now is the time to deal with it. And yeah, then I did that. And it wasn't a very pleasant journey, but yeah. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, obviously, he had some nice stuff too, but good. But the the not being able to remember, I wonder if that was intentional, like it just implanted something in your your subconscious, or even if it was part of you that you were communicating with. Um, but also, it could be because you were in another state of consciousness that it just didn't translate out of it. Yeah, after now over a decade of magical training and experiences, uh, um, that happens quite often to me that I go into trance and like I switch into another state of mind and whatever goes on there is quite hard for me to get into my logical day-to-day -day mind back. It's really mm -hmm. hard training to do that and sometimes I can remember, uh, sometimes I'm like aware of it, what's going on and sometimes I come back from my journeys and I don't remember. which is an important part for the story when we, we, we talked about the, like this time loop stuff it happened mm -hmm. there yeah first, so yeah yeah we yeah, I, 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 that yeah I, I started to accept that and, uh, <laughs> sometime it, it's it easier to remember sometime I don't remember stuff and I'm not sure if that's I think as, as far as I know my, myself, it might be better that I don't remember everything <laughs> you know yet, you know sometimes Rudolf tells me um, some uh, journeys he did or some experiences he had and and he says to me you know remember that just in case i forget it 
and mm. it could be important sometime. And uh, sometimes I, I say to him, you know, um, you told me that two years ago. I said, really? I did? That I <laughs> or, and oh, yeah, now that you remind me, yeah, there was some... Yeah, yeah, I, I remember. <laughs> so, so these kind of time loops or, or whatever you might call it, they, they quite uh, often occur to, to both of us. In fact. Yeah, but the thing is, I, as far as I'm, I mean, as I said, it's been a long journey now, but it, it's, it feels like a part of me is, has, um, is way more able to deal with the stuff than my day-to-day -day mind. Like, um, it it feels like when I have like some kind of encounters in 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 you know you wake up in the in the in the night and something is standing next to your bed. I mm. usually would panic, but then when when that magical part of me kicks in, it it knows what to do and how to handle that, and it like it takes over and deals with the stuff, and then I snap back and it's yeah. Then it's okay for me. So, but my it's just, I'm just not used to it in my in my day to day mind. So, um, it's strange. Well, that that's not that strange. That that makes sense. Yeah, sure. But it feels strange. That's what I'm. Okay. Thinking. Okay. Gotcha. Um, hmm. Yeah, it it definitely sounds like you either you yourself like on a, a deeper level or something is is kind of trying to guide you to certain things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As I said, due, due to the magical, I'm 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 quite quite uh, embedded in in chaos magic, um, which mm -hmm. helped me a lot, and that, that magical training helps me. It's like I'm I can enter that state and I can train in that and I can get better and then yeah, that it it takes over and do does the stuff it I, it has to do, and so I'm I'm feel quite guided and and protected from that part of me or whatever it is. I have no idea. Right. Right. Um. Uh, Go ahead. It's it's like um, oftentimes when we do rituals, um, it's uh, we we just have uh, an intention, and uh, you can see uh, something changes in Rudolf, and then he's just like instinctively uh, doing something, and that's without any concern or it's it's just uh totally in the moment and uh there's some some part of him that takes over yeah it's, I'm, it's really interesting and and it's like you you just uh you you observe it but but some some other part of you does the the ritual yeah I, I would say i would say because i'm i'm a very analytical person i'm very um well, you could I say left brain orientated, so so I'm very very logical and rational, and that also or sometimes um, interferes with the stuff I do. So it feels like that part is shut off, so it mm -hmm. doesn't interfere because else I would do mm. stupid stuff most likely. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I know myself. So I would <laughs> All right. Um, why, why don't we talk about the time? You sent me a time loop story. Yeah. Um, so should I just go from there? Yeah, um, yeah, go ahead. Um, so um, the, I have to talk a little bit about the background just to give sure. you a framework. Um, so um, uh, Jeff Kripal did, a, did an interview at the New Thinking Aloud with uh, uh, Jeffrey Mishlov. Um, he did several interviews in the last few months, and in one of them, he talked about an experience he had with uh, Whitley Strieber. Uh, they were in, at some kind of, uh, I think, at the Estelle Institute or some, for whatever reason, they shared a room on a on a on a travel. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, Whitley does this uh, day to day meditation at three a.m. in the morning, and he he did his usual meditation, and Jeff somehow woke up in that, and and suddenly he his mind split into two and he was fully aware of he of him being awake and and uh, just being in his day to day mind and he at the same time heard another part of himself watching what was going on in the room and starting to be in shock and awe of what's happening and he heard himself talking but he wasn't he didn't have the, that access to that part of him who watched Whitley Strieber during this meditation. And it was just a brief story in that interview. And 
that was the, I, uh, so I sent my experience to Jeff uh, because I also know that splitting of these two parts of yourself. And that's why I wrote the, finally wrote down the story and sent it to Jeff. And then I decided to, yeah, also send it to you because you just had this, a lot of listener stories mm -hmm. going on and said, well, it might be an interesting story uh, or at least an inter interesting read. And that's why you basically came, uh, why we get in contact other than, than Josh. And um, I did, in, um, there is a technique that is derived from the binaural beat stuff from um, Robert Monroe, from the Hemisync stuff. And it's from, a, it's from a German person who is a former trainer of the Monroe Institute and who also worked with uh, Robert Monroe. And he, he, he did his own thing later and he developed his own technique that uses uh, spinning 3D surround sound to, to achieve that uh, hemispheric synchronization and enter altered states of consciousness and um, induce out-of-body experiences and stuff. And it's, it's a little bit a more refined technique, I would say. It's more like a more holistic approach and not as uh, like a, a re very raw, um, clumsy approach to the binaural beat stuff, which I, which I also did the Hemisync program. But so I visited those, uh, the seminar in 2010 and it was a great experience, but I didn't when when I end every time I, I did one of those journeys, you listen to audio tracks and it's a five day program, and nothing really happened. So I experienced other stuff there, but yeah. So I I after that seminar I bought the audio tracks and you need special headphones and I bought everything and I did some occasional training with the audio tracks, but nothing too spectacular happened. So and then I I in 2011 I started to work as an as a as an equities and derivatives trader for an Austrian investment bank. And as you can imagine, it was a very horrible job, like stress-wise and the worth ethics and stuff. It, it wasn't the best surrounding for me, but it was an interesting experience. So in 2013, um, I decided I have to take some days off because like my whole magical training suffered from the stress. So I decided to go to Amsterdam for a week and redo that whole program, like listening to every audio track for five days straight and just do that somewhere else. And I basically spent half of the time of my holidays in Amsterdam in the, in the total room in the, uh, listening to the audio tracks. And again, nothing happened. And then the last night of the, of the holidays, I listened to the last audio track. And as usual, I entered the trance and I snapped back from the trance and an hour was gone and I couldn't remember anything. Hmm. So, and so the, I, I woke up and I was very frustrated because I was going to Amsterdam to experience something spectacular and to get back into my magical training and nothing happened. And suddenly I got this huge panic attack. I, I'm not very prone to panic attacks and I got the most horrible panic attack one I can imagine, like existential fears. And like my, I felt like my whole life was falling apart. And I, it, took, it lasted for an hour or so. And then I finally managed to come back from it and it was just a strange experience. And I went back to, to Austria and went back to my job and well, two, two months later, my whole life broke down. I lost my job, I lost my relationship, friendships broke apart, and I finally moved to Graz. And like my whole life was, com in, every, in every aspect you can imagine, my life completely turned around and I, nothing, I, I kept nothing, basically. Um, so fast forward to February 2017, like exactly four years later, I was again in, a, in a, some kind of a transitionary phase in my life. So I just somehow decided to redo that audio program again. So I again started on the first day with the first audio track. And again, nothing really spectacular happened. And I came again on the fifth day to the last audio track. And I was listening to the audio track. And when you do that audio track in the beginning, you always say your name and you say the date you're doing it and the, the location you're doing it. It works as a kind of an anchor over across time and space, just in case you travel somewhere and you experience some intense journeying. And then so it, it works like to, to, yeah, as an, as an lightning post, so to say, to find your way back in case something happens. So I was 
As you know, I said my name, Rudolf, it's February 2017, I'm in Graz, and I repeated that several times, and then I drift, started to drift off, in, off into trance, and somehow I, rem I'm, I'm, I lost track of what was going on, and I flipped back, and I was re-listening to what I'm saying, and I'm, I was still repeating, Rudolf, February 2017, Graz. And then I suddenly realized that I'm also saying Rudolf, February 2013, Amsterdam. And that went, went on for a minute or so. And mm. it felt strange, but I didn't realize in the first, at first. And then the moment I realized that I'm flipping between time and, and location, my mind split into two. And I was suddenly, literally lying in bed in Amsterdam, in my hotel room and in my living room in Graz at the same time and it, it it's very hard to explain like how that feels i could perceive myself from both both perspectives at the same time and both parts of me were aware of the other and i when i opened my eyes i could like literally see the room in amsterdam and the room in graz it's it's very strange to experience uh, to to explain and then the moment i realized that my mind split into split into a third part and I was like in a meta perspective, watching my two versions, having a conversation and talking about stuff. And it was, I mean, I'm, I'm oversimplifying it a little bit here, but it was like my, my, my 2013 version. The moment it, it, after the initial shock, it started like, okay, now I have the opportunity to talk to my future version. Like, are we rich now? Are we married now? Is everything <laughs> fine? Like the, 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 mo the, the most important questions, obviously. And, and my 2017 version said, well, glad you're already lying down because else I would have to ask you to sit down because what I'm going to tell you is not very nice. And then it started to tell me that, well, in... It's February 2013. Okay, like in two months, you will lose your job and your relationship will break apart and you will, will become unemployed and you will have to live uh, from 500 euros a month, which, is, which translates to roughly $600 a month, which mm. is not very much in Central Europe to yeah. live on. And like it, it started to, to completely overwhelm my, my, my earlier version. Like it told, it told all the stuff that's going on and my... 2013 version was just shocked and then couldn't take it and 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 then the, the journey ended and I came back and everything went back to normal and then I realized that that was the reason for my panic attack I got back in in 2013 in the hotel room in Amsterdam like all the the existential fears like my life like like this this unconscious uh, aware I, I completely shut down shut out the the, the memory of that event so that's where the amnesia came from, but obviously my unconscious still remembered what was happening, and that's where the panic attack came from. And um, yeah, so fast forward another year. It was now February 2018, and I was again doing this five-day program for whatever reason, again, up basically to the day uh, in February again. And on the fifth day, I was again listening to the audio track to the last one, and the same st stuff started to happen, like Rudolf 2018 in Graz in February, Rudolf 2017 in Graz, February, Rudolf 2013 in Amsterdam 2000, uh, um, in February. And again, my mind split into two and in, into three, and I, I, that was the third part. And I was now coming in from that meta perspective, like this third journey, um, like concluded the time loop. And I was now, because I was already aware of what was happening, I now had more of a meta perspective of perceiving what was going on. And then I, that was the first time I realized that it's, it has always been this, basically the same day, listening to the same audio track, just uh, four and five years apart, but more or less to the day. And listening to the same audio track at the same time somehow created like this resonance over time and and... I suddenly started to understand of why um, indigenous people have this magical timing of always doing the rituals in at specific times, right? And always doing the same rituals, and then like this concept of you're standing there with your ancestors. I always thought about it more in a metaphorical concept, 
like, oh yeah, we keep the tradition going and that somehow connects us to the ancestors. But that moment I realized, no, that means your, your ancestors and everyone who came before you and did that ritual at that time over the years and everyone after that is within that ritual space across time and like you're literally standing there with all your ancestors and everyone who comes after you and like this tribal knowledge that's somehow connected and forming that tribe spirit over time that that was the main thing i took from that and uh, yeah then the, the the journey ended and i came back again from that um yeah it wow. was quite quite a strange experience um and say, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if it was if it was a good story to tell now. I mean, I'm, if I could. No, it was, it was interesting. I, I've actually never heard anything like that before. That's fascinating. The um, so when you call it a time loop, do you think you had any choice in what was going on, or were you just replaying events that were already set? You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I cr actually created, if my future version created everything like in a more self-fulfilling prophecy. I have no idea if I would have, my, I, most likely, likely I would have lost a job because I wasn't very well integrated in the, into the, the working, in, into, yeah, into the work ethics and stuff in the banking mm -hmm. industry. So I would have lost a job anyways, I think, but and the, the relationship wasn't going well. So... I'm not sure if I created it or if I was just preparing Fated. it. I, yeah, I, I have no could, idea. Could it could it be something that you knew instinctually, the kind of presenting itself to you? Um, I thought about that. Maybe the the job stuff and maybe the relationship stuff. But there was so much going on. Like my as I said, my whole life broke apart, and I had a complete shift in everything in my life, like in, in concepts I wasn't aware of. I was a, back in the days, I was very conservative and had a very strict um, expectation regarding relationships, for example, and I was a very jealous person. And during that event, it basically told me, I myself told me, well, you will become a polyamorous and you will have to deal with your jealousy. And I, polyamory wasn't really a, a, a concept. Or it's, it's a relationship concept of right. where you have multiple partners and uh, and love interests and I wasn't really aware of that concept and it, I would have never thought about myself doing that and and there were other information that I was simply not aware of back in the days I no I had no concept of it at all so I'm not sh I would tend to say I didn't really feel it in a in a I would yeah hmm. okay well, I, th right. I think it, it it had some original information that I couldn't have made up right right just um, from the from the amount of stuff that was going on there now you had uh you sent me another one um that was just, my story as well yes. uh, the story of professor my, yeah yeah i i love it <laughs> you know um that was uh when i was yeah 10 11 12 years old the first two years of high school we had a biology teacher it was called professor Foyt. Um, and he was he was a great teacher. He was strict but fair, and and we we all loved him. Um, and he wasn't young anymore. Uh, my mother uh, had him as well. And um, I'm I'm telling a, a few specifics about uh, my my experiences with him because they are important later on. And he he oversaw a sort of boarding school that was associated with with our school. And uh, he used to tell stories um, in the last class before Christmas and mid-semester and the summer holidays. He, he ceased to, to teach us and he said, now I'm, I'm going to tell you a story. And it was, um, you know, it was an adventure story and he improvised it. He didn't plan it beforehand. He just told the story where it took him. And uh, he... Um, he continued later on. So a few months later, the last class before the, the next uh, holidays, he he continued where he stopped the last uh, time, and he so so he had three times uh, to to tell the story uh, over three times, 
and they were like, you know, the jungle expedition and, and they fell from the bridge and some got eaten by a crocodile and then they discovered, uh, uh, you know, an ancient hidden pyramid in the, and with secret passageways and they were transported or beamed to other planets and they had to decipher alien codes uh, using Kladni figures and so on. And, and um, my, my best friend, uh, whom I met in these first two years at high school, and we, we, we listened with, you know, uh, <laughs> we, it were, we did, those were the best stories ever. And um, fast forward um, four years, we, we were 16 by then. Uh, we, we didn't have him in, in class anymore because we went to another branch of, of the school. Uh, we were walking down the bus stop um, in the morning as usual. And there was the black flag flying in, in front of the school. And we, we asked what has happened. And we learned that uh, Professor Freud had died. Um, and at the end of the year, an, an obituary was, was published in the yearbook. I, I remember clearly there was his, his picture in, uh, in the top right corner. And uh, the text said that um, he had a lifelong interest in astrology. And it was, you know, he was a science teacher, and but but I I thought that suited him perfectly. He was such an open-minded person. And in the following years, uh, even after high school, my best friend and I we we would talk. Oh, it would be great to to talk to him again because of his perspective on things, you know. And then 2005, I gave a seminar in in Graz. And there was an attendee. Uh, woman who was several years older than me and uh, before the seminar she she came up to me and told me oh i've seen on your homepage you have uh, graduated at the same school as, as me and uh, i was there last weekend and we had a, a class reunion and even our old class teacher was there uh, professor Freud. I said, <laughs> professor Freud, you know you mean the biology teacher he said yes professor Freud. I said, but he's dead she meant, what, really? I mean, last weekend he was still, no, no, he's dead for 13 years. Mm. And are, are you sure we're talking about, you know, this, this teacher who, who headed this boarding school? And she said, yeah, yeah, the, the, the very same. And who always told these fascinating stories. Just, yes, I love those stories of him. And he was engaged in astrology. She said, yes, that's. That's correct. He, he told us about that last weekend. You know, he, he couldn't tell us when we were pupils. He was a respected science teacher and all that. So, and I said, but I know that from his obituary. And we, <laughs> we couldn't make anything of it. And so I asked my best friend, and he remembered it the same way as I did, you know, the black flag and everything. And uh, because we, we had talked about it every now and then. And I asked uh, fellow pupils, but all of them said, no, no, Professor Freud uh, is still alive. We, we, they, they hadn't heard otherwise. They, he must be very old uh, uh, now, of course. But So I, I called the school administration, and um, they told me over the phone, no, he, he's still alive. And, of course, I couldn't find my copy of that yearbook anymore. It was just... Oh, vanished, yeah. you know. Uh, of course, of course. So um, in 2012, I told this story to a circle of friends, and one of them asked me, "Have you tried to get in contact with him?" And you know, I I love it when it's spooky. I I just I I, I love that, and uh, I love to to pursue these these um, threats and and connect them. But it had never occurred to me to, to get in contact with him so clearly. And they said, well, try to, to call him. <laughs> and so I did. And then I heard his voice, you know. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm quite used to these sort of phenomena, but this shook me. He was, his voice was older, of course, but I remembered it so well from when I was a child. And uh, I tried to keep my cool and... And I said, but I think I, I stumbled. <laughs> like I, I started something like, you, you don't remember me, but I'm a former pupil, you know, and uh, maybe we could meet sometime because uh, I would love to discuss something with you. And she said, well, of course. What about? <laughs> well, 
<laughs> not sure. <laughs> Maybe something <laughs> about parallel realities. I don't know. <laughs> and you you think of that some some person you don't know who claims it it's a pupil uh, a former pupil of you and wants to talk to you uh, with you about parallel realities and he said of course well that's interesting <laughs> and he made an appointment <laughs> and we met a few days later in a cafe in Graz and I really I, I had no idea how to start this conversation with him and he entered the cafe and he was in his mid 80s by then completely healthy and totally sharp. Hmm. And so I, I decided to, to address it head on and told him the story as I'm telling it you now, how I had experienced it and my best friend. And he was slightly amused at first. He said, oh, that's very curious, you know, and, and a bit skeptically. But, um, but, but he was interested. And he asked me, yeah, but, but haven't you seen me in the school corridors? I mean, I mean, I was there, obviously. And I said, no. For the last two and a half years of our time in the school, it's not a big school, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we would meet him nearly daily in the corridors. And for, for two and a half years, you, you were dead. I mean, uh, uh, we, we talked about it. The, the whole atmosphere in school, all, all were shocked because you, you, you weren't there anymore. And I had the idea, maybe, you know, uh, memory is a curious thing. Maybe, uh, have you been ill at the same time or gra gravely ill? Uh, so maybe there was a rumor and, and we made up a false memory. But he had always been perfectly healthy. And mm -hmm. there was the, co uh, the fact, of course, that I knew about his interest in astrology. And he confirmed that he had never talked about it publicly. So, um, and that piqued his interest. He said, but... But uh, so it's just your best friend and you who remember me being dead. <laughs> and then it, I, I, I left him for that question. He asked me whether I had other memories that weren't persistent with this reality. You know, being in his mid 80s and that, that mind uh, like, OK, maybe there are some other things that that it doesn't that, that don't fit in this in this reality which i haven't i mean i had some some very vivid and continuous dreams uh, from a time when i lived in the south of italy um and i moved back to austria but in these dreams i had like this um kind of glimpses of what my life would have been if i if i had stayed there but um this was not the same thing so yeah we we just sat there and um was wondering and and then he opened up and he he talked about some other stuff he was interested in like anthroposophy he was you know he he read rudolf steiner and uh, he saw a ufo once and and the paranormal in general and the day after our meeting he called me up again and he he wanted to clarify a few things and and he told me that he already had ordered a book about quantum physics and parallel realities. <laughs> so so <laughs> he, was, he was just an amazing person. And I met him again a year later. And yeah, it was like, like meeting, meeting not a good friend because there was, he was such an authority figure, but, but we had a very good understanding. And once again, we concluded we, uh, we could only book it as a sort of fortune event. And then yeah. in... in in 2017, he, he passed away finally. He was nearly 90 years old. And up until this day, my, it's just me and my best friend who can remember this, um, this thing of, of him being dead. Wow. That's, that's really, uh, that sounds like sort of a mini Mandela effect, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. When, when does it count as a Mandela effect? Yeah, <laughs> the, well, that's it. How, how many people does it take to remember differently? <laughs> <laughs> In this case, there were only two. But yeah, it's a, it's a perfect uh, example of a Mandela effect. Huh. So how did you two get together? Like, how long have you known each other? Um, I th and we met in... 2011, I think, eight years now. The, yeah, the magical um, event. But we just met on the in the parking lot and just sh shook head. We have heard of each other, but we yeah. had the same 
broad circle of friends, but we never met in person and we never talked to each other. And then we met in, in Graz because I moved, I, 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 I fell in love with a woman in Graz who was living polyamorous life. And Bernard was already quite involved in that community. And so finally in, in so, somewhere between two, around about Christmas 2013, we met at the first time and uh, at, at a, a friend's party. And we started to talk about and then like, okay, interested in magic and the paranormal and, and yeah. And uh, we, we haven't stopped since. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately. You know, clicked, so. Yeah. In, in fact, um, I, I, there, there's another podcast here in Austria that's called Crop FM, a great show. And uh, I know the, the host uh, quite well. And I interested uh, uh, him in Chaos Magic, and he interviewed uh, some, some, some friends of us about Chaos Magic. And Rudolf heard this episode, uh, and that got him into Chaos Magic. So uh, we didn't know each other then, but it was my, uh, you know, my saying to, to Tarek, the host of Crop FM, do something about Chaos Magic that brought Rudolf to Chaos Magic a few years later on, and then we met properly in 2013, and uh, we found out that we had some very similar experiences, especially uh, some sort of shamanic initiation experiences, if you can call it that, and and our our interest in in the paranormal and and um, very similar viewpoints and and. Uh, yeah. So and and also the the experiences in uh, being being polyamorous, and and it was like finally there's another person that's crazy like me and uh, who who understands <laughs> what I'm saying. Without I I don't have to use metaphors. I can. Uh, that, I think that that's what brought us together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for me, chaos magic was like the missing, as I said in the beginning, I had like this training in, in somnambulistic hypnosis and remote viewing in out of body experiences. And I somehow knew they are somehow connected, but I lacked a, a meta paradigm or to how to fit those pieces of the puzzle together. And then listening to that show like clicked and uh, yeah, then chaos magic it was. And a year, few years later, we met in person and that's how it is now. <laughs> <laughs> and we do we do lots of stuff together, you know. We we both have a sort of a, a knack for yeah, what you could call defense against the dark arts. Uh, you know, we 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 are both quite apt at, at exorcisms and so on. And uh, you know, that's that's not not easy work. And uh, I've always sort of wanted a, a person who got my back and. Uh, then it was like, oh, you do. <laughs> you, 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 you can do that as well, and you, you aren't afraid of it because you know many many people. Are oh, I'm, I'm 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 sorry, I'm <laughs> supposed to swear. I'm I'm very yeah. afraid of that. Yeah. Uh, that, okay. Let me rephrase that. <laughs> but but you, this part of you that takes over isn't afraid, and I know I can I can totally. Um, rely on that part of you yeah yeah so earlier on we were talking about uh concepts uh over there that you don't see in other parts of the world mm -hmm. do you want to elaborate a little bit on that that i don't see I'm, 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 for, I'm forgetting exactly how you phrased it you said there's some stuff in, in, in there that you don't uh that that there doesn't seem to be an, analogies for other in other places I'm not exactly sure if I understand the question. Um, uh, do, you, do you mean specifically our Austrian viewpoint on magic, or yeah, uh, I, may, maybe you had said something at the very beginning, and I'm and I'm forgetting how you phrased it, but uh, it it sounded like something of that, uh, something that you only get there that you're not seeing in other places. So maybe that was it. Maybe you meant the viewpoint. Ah, uh, you mean what happens here in in, in the German speaking countries regarding? Maybe. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, go um, with that. Okay. No, um, 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 yeah. Well, yeah. For for example, we uh, what um, 
German people were one of the first people who who were trained in uh, the military grade remote viewing after the re the remote viewing program um, got public in the late 90s. Um, it it Germany was the first country it spread to. There were some German remote viewers who traveled to the United States and got trained there. So we have a, a very small but very um, strong remote viewing community who develop their own protocols and do it slightly different and have a but but, but there's a lot of, of 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 stuff going on in the remote viewing community we are involved in for example that um so we we, we have we hadn't said that we, we are both both of us are trained uh, remote viewers and we we do quite a few sessions uh, uh quite quite many sessions <laughs> sorry and uh, and and we we try to to do interdisciplinary work with that, you know, using other techniques as well. Mm. So, uh, um, yeah, it's basically, for example, if you you, you have some, some strange experiences and then we do a remote viewing session on that. So, and we have a very big UFO hotspot around Graz here in Austria. It's just an hour drive away where really a lot, very strange stuff is going on and, and UFO mass sightings and very strange high strangeness um stuff going on there so we were there well we, we could be there way more often but we're there sometimes and and then we try to verify uh, or falsify um events that happen and look at what's going on there and um yeah so there's a there's a strong um also strong magical community in austria and uh, especially in austria for whatever reason the, the the chaos magical scene is very very big compared to other countries so there's a lot going on there um yeah so let's yeah and yeah. and even the i think the country is very interesting you know it's uh the, it was a celtic country so uh, when we talked to to Joshua, uh, he said he would love to come here. There, there are many very, uh, very interesting findings, and uh, they are not so well known uh, as the, the British or the Irish ones. But uh, it's it's very strong Celtic ground here, and really? yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, one of the most fascinating things, uh, very close to Graz, it's uh, not even an, an hour drive away from here. Uh, subterranean tunnels. Um, there are there are man-made subterranean tunnels, um, and some of them are up to twenty thousand or thirty thousand years and older. And um, there's a professor from the University of Graz who um, a former professor. Yeah, sorry, former who who works on that, and um, they're they're just incredible. There, there, there are so many strange phenomena going on there as well. So, uh, and and many many folkloric things. You know, Bram Stoker, uh, uh, when he wrote Dracula, he it, at his first draft, uh, it was set in Graz, mm -hmm. and uh, only later on he moved it to to Transylvania. But uh, there are many stories about here uh, about vampires here as well, and. And so it's it's a very um, a dense and various paranormal landscape, if you will. Yeah. Gra Graz, is, Graz is basically built upon Celtic graveyards. So <laughs> yeah. that, that might, might have an impact. I don't know. <laughs> what what uh, have you guys witnessed? Any, have you been to these caves? Yeah, I have been. It's and, uh, it's it's strange. Uh, some some of them are from the Middle Ages, but the the very old ones, um, they have just this kind of uh, I would yeah, for lack of a better word, call it an yeah, sort of initiatory feeling. It's like crawling inside a womb or something like that. Hmm. And. Uh, there are many orbs around there. I, I haven't seen them, but at the UFO hotspot, uh, Rudolf mentioned, Knittelfeld, that's uh, very close to where I grew up. Uh, we have seen uh, several UFOs, or well, lights in the sky, you know. And um, yeah, it's, it's uh, <laughs> um, uh, some, uh, some tricksterish phenomena, you could call them. Like what? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Rudolf. <laughs> uh, I had the. I, I, we were there. Uh, we were four, four people there, 
um, sometime a few years ago and we were as usual we were watching the sky we were some on, on some kind of, of a hills uh, and the, the 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 city was in in the valley beyond uh, beneath us and there's a quite great spot to have like the two overview the the whole area and we were watching the skies and nothing really spectacular happened that night and like every one of us had some strange um, experience with uh, with some flashes in the sky or whatever, but nothing too spectacular. And everyone perceived those events separately, like only for himself. And I didn't really see something. And but the the atmosphere was very. At this night, it was a very strange atmosphere there. Not not creepy, but different than usual. Nice. And then. I'll, yeah, and then and then uh, uh, the, a female friend of us so who was with us. Um, well, she had to take a, a pee, and, and it was quite dark where we were, and she asked if someone could escort her just around the corner so she could yeah, do, yeah. do her business. And so I said, I was looking down the valley, and just behind us, there was a, there's a, like a slope, a meadow, um, and like 50 meters, um, and then there's, there was a small group of trees there, and I, just behind me, and I... I I turned around 180 degrees and I reached into my pocket and pockets and I said the words, yeah, no problem. I do have a flashlight on my phone. And the moment I said the words flashlight on my phone, my right hand touched the phone in my jacket and I was looking the 100 degrees back into uh, onto the, the slope in, and the trees. And suddenly... Uh, I don't know, um, a, a spot of light, like, like, like God himself would light a flashlight from the sky. It, it was just a circle of light moving completely arbitrary and quickly from the group of trees. They, they were highlighted and then it moved across the meadow towards us and quickly went back again and it was gone like two or three seconds later. And it was just like like a flashlight shining down from the sky at the moment I said the words I have a flashlight in, on my phone, I, I'm not, <laughs> something like that, for example. So, it's, but but it was it wasn't a beam of light. It was just a circle of light on the ground. Yeah. So you didn't see the stream of light coming down from somewhere. It was just completely, lo uh, just just a circle of light on the on the on the on the slope moving, completely arbitrary, quickly, just. And it was gone again in two or three seconds. It was just, I don't know what it was. I have no idea. It was just a very strange synchronistic event, uh, for example. And yeah. Huh. That's interesting. Yeah, it creeped me out a little bit. Uh, yeah, I can see that. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. And she, she didn't want to go to the toilet after that. So. <laughs> just, we just left her like 10 minutes later. <laughs> As I said, it was just a strange atmosphere that night. I've, it wasn't threatening, but it was not as usual. So, yeah, not the most spectacular story, but strange. <laughs> no, that's that's actually really interesting. Um, how how is this stuff dealt with in in like Austria and stuff as opposed to how you see it being dealt with in other other places? It's ridiculed completely. It's uh, only shows like ours and crop of them to talk about it and there are some other you know like like fringe podcasts or, or blogs um that, that talk about it but from a mere yeah, like materialistic viewpoint like like uh the propagating the eth mm -hmm. but in the mainstream media it's it's ridiculed or not even mentioned um yeah so i i think that's basically what it will be in, in the US, I think. Yeah, uh, but um, how it's different, I, I, I would say it's not, um, it, there is like a, like a magical community here who treats those um, experiences, I would say from a little bit different mindset of because we, I, I would say, I'm just speculating here obviously, but it's more like uh, because of the Celtic, background of the country and a lot of people somehow it's 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 more like being more connected with the with the well with the country with nature it's, it's i mean that's a bit of a strange concept but or but 
I, f I feel that people are more connected with uh, their backgrounds, with the maybe the ancestors, if you want to call it, with the spirit world. So it's a more more harmonious um, approach to those phenomena, and it's somehow more. There's some maybe some kind of more interaction and more of a magical interaction with those phenomena, not as much as si just a scientific approach or a, the, the paranormal approach, like a paranormal researchers or stuff like in maybe in the US. There, there are not that many paranormal researchers or ghost hunters that you as you would you would perceive or if you as you would have in the in the in, in, in the US. It's more like uh, trying to i think a lot of people are aware that that phenomena is more connected with well let's call it the spirit world or with consciousness or like there's a in more connectedness between the people themselves and the phenomena and that that, that, that i would say is a more more typical approach in magical ex, uh in, in in the magical culture here yeah maybe and yeah and, and of course you know austria is, is very catholic so, um, if you talk to to people alone in the in the country who have witnessed some some phenomena, they they you know usually they, it's like yeah, it was like sort of a miracle or, or something like that, uh, and it, it's um, they, they they don't try to to talk about it too much, uh, but I think because of of the yeah the, the atmosphere around here they, they can they can sort of like may deal with it and so yeah it it happened uh i won't yeah uh, i was i would I, say people are more 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 in tune with strange stuff going on without really thinking about it too much it's it's just yeah strange stuff happens i would say that's yeah that's, but you uh, don't talk about it that's, hmm. yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's yeah, more yeah. like yeah, sorry. No, go ahead. Mm. It's so it's more accepted, it's sort of underground is what you mean? Yeah, somehow. Maybe maybe, maybe the... yeah, maybe the, the mentality uh accepts it a little bit more I possibly. And I would and then... say it, it 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 creates the phenomenon more often on an unconscious level for people because it's it's more people are more more somehow connected to that phenomena, so it, it appears more often or it interacts more often. But yeah, that that maybe uh, that that might be. So okay. we're not really answering the questions because I don't really know. <laughs> but, uh, That's all right. That's I'm okay. just as I said, we're we're just speculating here. But yeah, and hmm. uh, what what I experienced is is that. Uh, in in certain subcultures uh, where you would expect people to have an open mind for paranormal phenomena they just don't like the the pagan community or even some in the, in the magical community um or some they they, uh, they don't take it seriously yeah, like, really yeah, yeah it's like you know it's like uh, reenactment or or larping magic uh, but if you talk about uh, UFOs and uh, some some uh, very high strangeness phenomena you have experienced, or some other people have experienced, they tend to uh, ridicule it as well as the mainstream people. Well, but on the other side, it is more embedded in the culture. So because we have a lot of stories going back uh, in our cultures. Um, some people it help for some people it helps to have that background of this old stories and the 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 bedtime stories you know the grandmothers mothers tell you tell the children it is somehow more in tune with people and it's more in, in embedded in the culture but at the same time because there are that many strange stories str strange grandmother stories that's also for some people they just keep it there it's just yeah grandmother stories it's just mm -hmm old stories it's just superstition so yeah it's strange mm. from the culture and and of course there are some people who profit from that you know they they blow up the the phenomena out of proportion and they do like 
uh, walks up to the sacred mountain and uh, I'll tell you the story, but I'm not supposed to tell you, of course, I can only hint at it, but buy my book. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what I mean? They are, they yeah, are novels, yeah. uh, and, but uh, I'm not allowed to, to talk about it publicly, but if you can read between the lines, you will know I'm the grandmaster or something like that. There, there, there's also this scene as well. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, and at the, but, at the but, same time, you have a you have a big uh, occult history in Austria, like different lodge systems and whatever you you think of them. But but and the the the, the we we had a monarchy quite long and, and until the 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 First World War, and there was a lot of going going on there regarding alchemy and stuff. And so it's it's somehow connected with the culture, and at the same time, it's somehow separated. It's very strange, but there's. There's a, like an occult background in in our culture, uh, so it's 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 just strange. Mm. Um, not not I have no idea if that somehow influences that, but it's interesting. And yeah, at the same time, I would say there's a lot of input from the United States or from from other cultures, uh, like the Rune Soup uh, show with Gordon White, for example, or your show, um, and people trying to analyze that from a from our cultural perspective and try to implement those ideas and for example i'm a, i'm a quite big fan of of uh, perspectivism and animistic um ideas like uh, from anthropology like people like eduardo Cohn, uh, who, who wrote a great book uh, by the way um, how forests think and and, and uh, eduardo viveros uh, de castro who wrote a great paper um Uh, cosmic dikes and pan um, pan indian uh, Ameri indian um perspectivism and i think they they are they show a completely new approach to paranormal stuff that's also quite an interesting thing like um it's a bit too too long story to explain here now but um when you think about uh, Joshua Kachin's work for example with the, with the fae folk um, and fairies Like you have the and the encounters with uh, eating food uh, in the in the fairyland that will um, trap you there, or you 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 have the 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 fairy gold that will turn into a a piece of rock here, or if you return from the fairylands and you have eaten some delicious food, you you just start to vomit up twigs and rocks and mm -hmm. dirt mm -hmm. and worms and and. This anthropology, this approach from anthropology, I would say, is an amazing idea of perspectivism of how 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 you switch perspectives between those realities and how something that looks completely rotten here might turn into delicious food for a, for an animal or for the spirit world. So I would say that's also a very, very interesting thing going on at the moment here, uh, trying to implement those anthropological research into magical thinking. That's, yeah, that's something we try to do here and bring, bring, their, uh, bring into the culture here. Um, so if, if you're interested in that stuff, it's really great to read. It's, yeah. All right, all right. Do you, let, let, let's hear a couple more of your personal stories before we run out of time here. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll let you guys pick. Well, give me a real, well, you've already given me some strange ones. Pick another strange one. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of two stories. One I had in, in uh, Romania, in, in the, a haunted forest there, mm. or some other time let's loops. Do, yeah. Let's do the Romanian forest one. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm, I also uh, taught uh, screenwriting uh, for several years, and mm. uh, I was involved in, in several um, TV shows uh, I was preparing, and uh, there was one uh, documentary being made about vampires and, and folk magic in, in modern Romania. And uh, because I know quite a bit of this stuff, I had uh, um, a director who's also a close friend, Uh, uh, with the with the, the preparations, and uh, at some point he asked me, "No, uh, Bernhard, you have to to get in front of the camera. Come come with us to Romania." And uh, we were there at the, you know the the castle who was most likely the um, 
origin for for Bram Stoker's Dracula Castle, and uh, we we took part in an exorcism ritual of the Romanic Church, um, you know, with with hidden cameras. Uh, this was very very intense. Uh, we we expected that they came up with with forks and pitchforks uh, at, the, at the time. It was uh, hmm. uh, they, they do this stuff in the 21st century over there right now. It's it's very very intense. They they've got. Uh, monks who crucify nuns uh because they they want to save their souls you know it's it's uh wow uh, yeah yeah it's uh it's very hush hush but uh, we got to know a journalist who covers these stories up and if they got arrested they don't know why because you know uh yeah she may have died but we have saved their soul so um it's it's very it's very um interesting way of of thinking in in modern times and um there's one special forest over there. It's called the Baju Forest. Uh, it's also named uh, one of the most haunted places of the world. Mm -hmm. It's uh, close to Cluj. Uh, it's, the, it's a town in, in Romania, in Transylvania. Um, it's directly at the, at the city limits. And the people over there, um, they're absolutely afraid to go there. Uh, they say it's, it's haunted, it's cursed you're not allowed to go there at night it's it's just just don't no and uh, <laughs> we <laughs> we we arrived there uh before it went dark uh and then we would head up to the woods and we would meet someone who showed us the way there and at the hotel everyone said are you crazy you, you're not supposed to go there and <laughs> and there was there was uh, one one young guy who said well maybe if you pay me enough i will show you and it um it was the son of the hotel manager and his father uh, uh, got got word of it and he 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 was very angry and said you're not supposed to you you i don't allow it and you know you, you could tell the people were genuinely afraid of, of this forest yeah. And after some, you know, uh, explaining and going on, we we managed to find one guy, a, a boxer. He said, "Well, he he would accompany us to the outskirts of Cluj, and and he would show us where where the wood started, but he wouldn't go any further." And uh, then we drove up there. It was it was dark already, and our driver, who was from Romania, of course, he he had bought many crucifixes. Uh, and he put them in the in the front window of his car. He couldn't uh, see the road anymore <laughs> because of all the of all the crucifixes. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, so so there we went. It was it was um, it was completely dark, and um, and you know it was a, a very very strange atmosphere. It was dense and. Uh, the other guys from the the team they they put out their equipment and they said okay you uh, you have you have to do your your thing several minutes um, I will go into the, the woods first I I want to to greet the spirits you know I want to to tell them uh, we we come in peace we don't want any any trouble it's just for for television we're interested uh, whatever happens and to get a feel for for the land you know. So I, I uh, crossed the border and into the woods and uh, I went up there like 100, 150 meters. One other girl who was, who was with us, a young woman, uh, she went with me. Uh, we, we didn't have a, a torch or something. It was just, just us in the, in the, in the dark. Um, and we had to, to hmm. sort, of, sort of feel our way. And I felt this, this woods were like alive. Of course, every every wood is alive, but this was very, very much alive. Um, and when we were about yeah, hundred, hundred fifty meters in the into the wood, um, I, I can't I can't make the sound now because it would be too loud. It was out of nowhere. It was like a boom sound, like mm. like. Uh, it uh, it nearly threw me off my my feet. It was so loud, like like an explosion or something, and and quite close, out of nowhere, and we were just standing there. And then there was another boom, 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 and it was coming closer. <laughs> that, that, that was like it 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 sounded like something 
very, very big and very, very heavy was jumping towards us. And it was just these sounds. And I said, okay, I suppose that's how far we go. Uh, let's turn around, go back to the others. <laughs> <laughs> we went out there. And they were standing there. And uh, we came out of the woods and they said, did you hear the sounds? I said, yeah, <laughs> it's coming after us. <laughs> and uh, at the same time we were in the woods, some of our team uh, was... Um, was, uh, it was, I think it was the boxer, in fact, he was, he was going down, there was just one tiny hut, uh, there was a small light, that, that was the only um, place over there where, where some, someone lived, and he came back and he told us this is, um, how do you call a person who, who looks after the, the, the sheep and... and uh, um, oh, uh... Well, a sheep herder, a shepherd. Yeah, I, a shepherd. I, yeah, yeah, shepherd. a shepherd. There we thank go. You. Thank you. Thank you. He uh, he he told us he he doesn't want to live there, but uh, he's very poor, and uh, that's the only place he can live. Um, and when he came up to to us, uh, the camera was was running already, uh, you know, with this uh, green screen because it was dark, and I said nobody's gonna believe us because he just looked like we had cast him you know uh he was he was a hunchback and he had only two teeth left and he was leaning on his on his uh stuff and he came up to us and, and uh he knew what we were gonna ask him because there are all always camera teams over there and and people from uh several universities who want to to explore this um this woods and and he said, mm -hmm. yeah, he he will he will guide us into the woods because uh, none of our persons uh, would would go into that. And there's um, a small uh, clearance. Is that the right word? Well, when the yeah, clearing, yeah, clearing, yeah, yeah. N nothing grows there. We heard about it. Uh, it just yeah, yeah. Uh, there's nothing. It's a it's a place about yeah, like like. 200 meters in diameter or something and, and just nothing grows that and the grass is like dry and and there uh, that's the place where all the the high strangeness phenomena to, uh, take place and uh, he he would guide us there and the, the trees were very uh, you know they, they were deformed grotesquely and it was a strange atmosphere and uh, um, some of the others they were very afraid and said you know, look it's it's nothing to be afraid. It's just, it's strange. It's maybe alien. It's, it's some otherness here, but it's not malevolent. Let's, let's, you know, have an open mind. Let's, let's uh, see what, uh, what's going on there. And so we went into the woods and after a few minutes, you had your classical Oz effect. It was mm -hmm. within, within one second, it was like a, sound and then everything went still not a, a dog uh, uh not a you know nothing nothing not not, uh, not not the trees rustling so it was uh, you, the world went totally still and then we arrived at this clearing and the director said to we, there were three protagonists um two to women and me and he said to us, "Well, uh, spread out. Uh, go alone. Find find some place where you where you will be. Sit down, meditate, whatever you do, and try to soak up the atmosphere. And then we will come with with the camera, and uh, I will interview you. What what the, what you think about this place, and so on." And, uh, the women said, "No, we're not going alone." And he said, "Well, you have to go <laughs> go on." And, and I was so, okay. <laughs> Ella, finally, finally, I can I can go explore. And uh, I went uh, nearly to the other side of the clearing. Uh, it was just just my eyes had adjusted to the to the moonlight a bit, and in the in the grass I saw something like a circle or. or two concentric circles. I was not quite sure because it was dark, and, but it, it had, I had the impression that somehow at this point, the grass was a different color, like, like it was burnt or uh, some other shade of, of grass. And it was like, you know, like a classical magical circle, two, two concentric circles. Mm. And I thought, okay, that's the place for me. And, um, so I went into that, <laughs> <laughs> and there was something lying on the ground, something black, 
no, I, um, uh, uh, and I picked it up and it was a coomb. Huh. It was to totally absurd. Um, and well, yeah, I sat there and then um, there was a light in the sky, um, um, very, very bright um, for like one, one and a half, two seconds um, or without any noise. And then they came, they interviewed me. I told them about the light uh, that appeared and disappeared without a sound. It was brighter than, than anything I had ever seen. And when I told them this, uh, this story, another, it was not a light. It was like um, a vertical line that appeared in the sky, glowing orange. Um, and it went horizontally uh, through the sky. It was like something scanning us. To, and I was the only one who saw it, of course, because everyone was looking at me being interviewed. <laughs> I tell them, ah, do you see it over there? And uh, the moment they turned, it vanished. Um, and so on. And, and, and yeah, we, uh, at some time, I had the feeling of being stared at from, from a very high position, like something higher than the trees was crouching down looking down at me and when we when we left the place the director who was last he uh, turned and he said he saw some like 30 white figures standing there staring at him so this was oh. just just a, a a plethora of of high strangeness phenomena and we were just there for only like two hours and uh, I always <laughs> want to, I wanted to go back there and for for uh, a night at least to to be there. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And how far is that from where you live? Oh, yeah. With you have to by plane. You have to go like mm, maybe one and a half hours. Okay. Well, that's yeah. not too bad by plane. It's not too bad, but yeah. Yeah, so, someday I, I will return to it. And <laughs> yeah. All right. That definitely counts as a strange story. Yeah, I would say so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I always, when, when I met Rudolf, I, I told him, just, you know, go with me to Transylvania. Let's go into the woods. <laughs> no. Never, ever, never going to happen. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> I'd, I'd yeah. go with you. Yeah, yeah. obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I think you would love it there, Saraya. <laughs> uh, I, I would definitely be fascinated, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, so we're just about out of time, but you guys are going to stick around and do a uh, uh, Patreon segment. Yeah, sure. And we will we'll maybe talk about a little bit about your magical practices. How does that sound? Happily. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, tell people where they can find you online. Oh, so that's um, our our homepage is www.reicherundstark.at, um, and uh, on YouTube just um, put in Reicher and Stark. Um, All right. Yeah. And people if he, if people want to if people want to write you. Do you have like a social media presence or anything? Um, yep. Um, you, we have a contact formula on the homepage. Um, okay. And people could yeah, comment on the videos. So, so we try to, to answer every comment. And, and yeah. that's a Facebook we, page as well. Yeah. We also, yeah. We also have a Facebook page, exactly. The, Thanks. That's also that. called yeah. Reich and Stark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thank you so much for for this. And uh, we'll we'll get into this Patreon segment as well. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you Bye. for having us. And a special shout out to our patrons pledging $10 or more. Allison Cook, Lindsay Marie Trebet, Nick Martin, Super Inframan, UFO Weekly News, Tim, Maria, Nate Syria, Jennifer Campbell, Mike McGuire, American Rambler, Paul Buscini, Kevin, Chris Johnson, 36 Dingo, John Rutledge Foster, Eric Citron, Ben Crow, Janet Runyon, Andy McNamara, Sasha Lorg, Christopher Vaughn, Riker and Stark, 
Rogelio Gonzalez, Roland Belstadt, Robert Groom, Sean Cosgrove, Jose A., Craig Sisternos, Charles Beauregard, Matthias Sunby, Lindsey Jackson K., Alfred Tuttle, Kevin Schreck, Patricia Gaiaquinta, William Lovelace, Mark Brady, Chris, John Eddy, and Carla Mahoney. Thank you all so very much. All right, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, there is more with Riker and Stark in a Patreon segment where we talk about some of their magical practices and other experiences. We'll see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support. <laughs>